Your lecturer is Dr. Katherine McClyman. Dr. McClyman is chair and professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Georgia State University, where she has received the College of Arts and Sciences Outstanding Teaching Award and the Distinguished Honors Professor Award. Dr. McClyman earned her BA in History and Literature from Harvard University and her MA and PhD in Religious Studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She has written widely on religion and ritual, including two books, Beyond Sacred Violence, A Comparative Study of Sacrifice, and the forthcoming Ritual Gone Wrong, What We Learn from Ritual Disruption. In the beginning, there was chaos, a gaping abyss, dark and unformed. Out of the abyss emerged three primordial elements, Gaia, the Earth, Tartarus, a cave-like space under the Earth, and Eros, sexual desire. Other beings came forth from these primordial elements, including Oranos, the sky. Gaia and Oranos mated, and their union produced the first generation of gods, the Titans. It was only after a great war between the Titans and the Olympians, a second generation of gods, that humanity as we know it came into being. So begins the story of the creation, according to Greek mythology. But this story tells us much more than how the Greeks thought the world came to be. Like other great myths, it opens a window onto the entire culture that produced it. We learn how the ancient Greeks saw themselves in relationship to the natural world, the divine world, and other creatures. We get a sense of their moral universe as well as the cosmic universe. And we get a taste of the ancient Greek imagination, how it expressed beauty, virtue, conflict, and evil. In this 12-lecture series, we'll explore the great myths of Greece, Rome, and other parts of ancient Europe. These great myths are much more than entertaining stories. They carried weight in their cultures by explaining the world and by investing everyday life with meaning for ancient peoples. And thousands of years later, many of these myths still speak to our own universal human experience. This is the art of mythology setting human experience on a cosmic stage. The great mythologies reflect the particular experiences and worldviews of particular peoples, yet they contain kernels of truth about human experience that transcend space and time. As we begin this journey, it's important to think about what we mean by myth. In everyday conversation, people often use the word myth to suggest that a story is fake or untrue, the word has a negative connotation. But that's not the case here. Instead, I'm going to use the term, as many other scholars do, to refer to a story that has meaning or significance beyond the story itself. It's also important to note that myth is not religion. Religion involves beliefs, ritual and bodily practices, history, institutions, and normative values. Mythology is, at its foundation, storytelling. Now, myth often draws on or speaks to religious traditions, but myth itself is best understood as stories that provide an explanation for various cultural elements, investing those elements with an origin, purpose, and value. Some scholars make sharp distinctions between myths, legends, and folk tales. Well, I resist those distinctions, particularly when I'm comparing story traditions from around the world with one another. In my experience, the term folk tale gets used dismissively. So think about this for a minute. We talk about great mythologies, but do we ever talk about great folk tales? These distinctions have been used to suggest that one set of stories is more significant than another, and I disagree with that view. For that reason, in this series, I'll refer to story traditions using terms such as myth, legend, and folk tales interchangeably. So let's continue with the Greek creation story. As I mentioned, 
the primordial Uranus fathered the first generation of gods known as the Titans. The Titans were physically imposing and virtually immortal, but their father despised them. Uranus banished his offspring to Tartarus, the dark cave-like region under the earth. This is often interpreted as Uranus trying to unbirth his own children by shoving them into dark caverns, as if he were shoving them back into the womb. Kronos, one of Uranus' sons and the leader of the Titans, hated his father because of this banishment. According to the legend, Kronos attacked his father with the help of his mother. Ultimately, he cut off his father's genitalia, castrating him. We'll see in upcoming lectures that the theme of father-son conflict appears repeatedly in Greek mythology. For some reason, stories about fathers rejecting their sons and sons murdering their fathers resonated with the Greeks. There's something universal about sons wanting to supplant their fathers, but Greek mythology features this conflict much more often than other traditions. After Cronus defeated his father, he settled down with Rhea, who was both his sister and his wife. This also isn't unusual in Greek mythology. Lots of gods marry their sisters. And we know that this happened in upper-crust ancient Greek families as well, so the mythology here reflects a social reality. Kronos and his sister wife Rhea had several children, including the first generation of Olympian gods. These were the most famous gods, the ones who would ultimately rule over the earth from Mount Olympus. According to the great ancient Greek poet Hesiod, the age of Kronos' rule was the Golden Age, the age in which the first race of humans was created, a race that long predated ours. Hesiod describes the Golden Age by saying, Men lived like gods, without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. Miserable age rested not on them, but with legs and arms never failing, they made merry with feasting beyond the reach of all evils. When they died, it was as though they were overcome with sleep, and they had all good things. They dwelt in ease and peace. Now, of course, this perfect age couldn't last. It never does in creation stories. As you can imagine, Kronos worried that his children might do to him what he had done to his own father. In an attempt to avoid this, Kronos decided to eat his children. He swallowed them one by one as they were born. But this strategy turned out to be short-sighted. Rhea, the mother in this story, became a bit tired of Kronos eating all their offspring. So when Zeus, the youngest child, was born, she decided to trick Kronos. She switched the baby Zeus with a stone, and Kronos didn't seem to notice. He swallowed the stone instead of his infant son, and Rhea hid Zeus on the island of Crete until he grew up. Eventually, when Zeus was full grown, he returned home. Zeus forced Kronos to regurgitate the stone and all of Zeus's siblings. Then he was joined by the other Olympic gods in an attack against Kronos and the other Titans. The battle between the Titans and the Olympic gods, known as the War of the Titans, lasted for 10 years. Greek myth contained several different versions of the war, but in every version, Zeus ultimately triumphed. After Zeus and the gods defeated the Titans, they forced the Titans underground, bound them with chains in the same prison where Uranus had previously kept them captive. Later, the Olympians also vanquished a race of giants that Gaia bore in an attempt to restore the Titans, her children, to power. And from that point forward, the Olympian gods ruled, having displaced the Titans forever. How do we make sense of all of this? What kind of a worldview imagines fathers swallowing their infant children or banishing them to the bowels of the earth? And why tell stories about a former generation of gods, a step removed from the Olympian gods? We don't have any definite answers to these questions, but ancient Greek stories about a primordial time and a primordial race suggest two things to me. First, they depict a world of violence and hardship. 
To live was to experience hardship and suffering. The question was how to respond. Second, the Greeks valued the skills and qualities that enabled them to triumph over violence, chaos, and aggression. We'll see this come up in a later lecture in the story of Odysseus, the hero of Homer's Odyssey. He's not always a good man, but he's a brave, clever, sometimes deceptive man who learns from his experiences. And because of that, he manages to survive and to take back control of his home and his family. The story of the Titans becomes a kind of cautionary tale for future generations. Even the mighty can fall, sometimes at the hands of their own kin. It takes not only strength, but cunning and wisdom to survive. Some Greek thinkers drew direct connections between the Titans and humanity. That is, humanity in their day, not the early humans of the Golden Age. Olympiodorus argued that contemporary humanity arose out of the ashes of the burning Titan corpses when the Titans were ultimately defeated. Other early writers implied that humanity was born out of the blood shed by the Titans in their war against Zeus. According to Plato, the human body is titanic in nature, while the soul is divine. All of these perspectives suggest that humanity contains some titanic element, and that this element is at war with other elements within us. They also seem to place the Greeks in an uncertain relationship with the powerful yet capricious gods who were in charge of their world. And that may be just the way they saw themselves, with respect to their divinities. At this point, it might be helpful to talk about the sources we have for the stories of the Titans and other Greek mythology. Originally, many of the stories that we know took shape as oral traditions. That is, they were transmitted orally through storytellers and were only written down later. The flowering of Greek mythology occurred during the Archaic and Classical periods, from roughly 700 BCE until 323 BCE, when Alexander the Great died. Greece embraced poetry and epics and theater, all of which included a heavy dose of mythology. From about 700 BCE on, Greece began to keep written records, adopted the Phoenician alphabet, and then subsequently developed its own alphabet, and self-governing city-states began to establish themselves. Throughout this critical period in the development of Greek mythology, the people of the Greek city-states experienced several long, violent conflicts, particularly between about 500 and 323 BCE, throughout the entire classical period. Here we see similarities between the Greek experience and the myths they tell about the first generation of the gods. For hundreds of years, ancient Greek life meant conflict, and the stories of the Titans reflect this. Probably the most famous author of Greek myths is Homer, who's generally credited with writing the grand epic poems focused on the Trojan War and its aftermath, the Iliad and the Odyssey. You may have seen images of Homer as an elderly, blind man. There's considerable debate surrounding him, including whether or not a real Homer ever existed, and if he did, whether all the works attributed to him were actually composed by him. Some scholars believe that Homer is actually a composite of several different people. For our purposes, we'll refer to Homer as if he did exist, and will date him to the 8th century BCE, just as the Greeks were stepping into the Archaic period. There's another important Greek author I've already mentioned, Hesiod. Hesiod is usually dated to around 700 BCE, and his material differs a bit from Homer's. Scholars do believe that there was an actual Hesiod, to whom certain works can be attributed. But other material circulates under his name that was clearly composed by other figures. The two complete Hesiod poems that we have are the Theogony and the Works and Days. As the title suggests, the Theogony describes the origins and activities of the gods, including the creation story at the start of this lecture. The Theogony is written as a hymn of praise offered by the muses themselves. 
Works and Days, by contrast, focuses more on the world in which we humans live, but it's set against the theological backdrop presented in the Theogony. Hesiod, then, is a nice complement to Homer. He spells out the mythological history that Homer only alludes to. Finally, a group of later writings is known as the Orphic material. This includes poems and hymns dating from the end of the 6th century and later. Orphic material is traditionally attributed to a mythical poet named Orpheus, but scholars tend to argue that multiple authors wrote under the pseudonym Orpheus. This wasn't unusual for the time. In several ancient cultures, authors would associate their work with the authority, personality, style, and themes of one umbrella name. The Orphic Corpus includes literature from around 6th century BCE all the way through the 5th century CE. Orphic material has a dark note to it, or at least a note of mystery, even strangeness. It probably grows out of an idiosyncratic religious community dedicated to the worship of Orpheus, a hero with superhuman musical talents who tried to rescue his wife from the underworld. One ancient author warns that Orpheus's poetry is something strange and riddling for people. The Orphic material often includes writings that we don't find in Homer or Hesiod. Even more interesting, sometimes it presents different versions of stories told elsewhere. For example, Orpheus's version of the War of the Titans differs a bit from Hesiod's version. According to Orpheus, in order to make it easier for Zeus to attack his father, Rhea hosted a banquet to which Kronos was invited. During the banquet, Rhea plied Kronos with alcohol, and Kronos became drunk. This made it possible for Zeus to get close enough to Kronos to castrate him, without Kronos putting up much of a fight. Also, the Orphic texts state that when Zeus decided to turn over his throne to his son Dionysus, the Titans grabbed the child and they tore him limb from limb in a savage attack. They put his dismembered body in a pot to boil, and they roasted his limbs over a fire. When Zeus found out about this, he destroyed the rebellious titans with his thunderbolt. And Dionysus was reborn because the goddess Athena was able to preserve his heart. The wealth of written sources on Greek mythology has taught us a great deal. But there are other wonderfully illuminating sources as well. We find images from Greek mythology on personal items, such as pottery, especially vases, plates, and bowls. Archaeologists have found ancient Greek flasks from the 5th century with images that can easily be identified as the gods Poseidon and Persephone. They've also found jewelry with images of the demigod Heracles, called Hercules by the Romans, fighting the many-headed hydra. The Judgment of Paris, the beauty contest between the goddesses Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite that we'll discuss in the next lecture, is captured on red clay pottery as early as the 6th century BCE. Think about what this says about the importance of myth to the ancient Greeks. Think, too, about our own world. We put celebrities and their names on t-shirts, lunch boxes, and clothing brands. But true heroes, men and women whose achievements transcend their own lifetimes, continue to be memorialized permanently. Think of Lincoln on his chair at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., the four presidents on Mount Rushmore, the Vietnam War Nurses Memorial. True heroes are captured in stone. The highlights of Greek mythology were also displayed in architecture. Public buildings functioned like the stained glass windows of medieval Christian churches many centuries later. The Greek temples told their culture's sacred stories, and they saw these stories as part of their religious as well as cultural life. Temple friezes, pediment areas, and the large stone panel sections known as metopes were particularly popular places for decorative sculpture or painting that illustrated scenes from important myths. For example, on the Parthenon, the great temple at Athens 
all 14 metopes on the front or the east of the temple include scenes of the gigantomachy, the primordial battle between the giants and Olympian gods that followed the War of the Titans. On the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, the 12 metopes are dedicated to the 12 labors of Heracles. The base of the great altar at Pergamon offers another, even more dramatic depiction of the gigantomachy. Public spaces such as the great altars and temple panels were the billboards of their day, providing a 24-7 public recitation of key mythological moments and reminding folks how and why religious practices had been instituted in the past. Sometimes the artifacts and architectural elements offer the earliest evidence of a myth that we have, predating the literary sources available to us by several centuries. And sometimes archaeological work has raised questions about whether a myth is entirely mythical after all. German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann traveled to Mycenae in the 1870s because ancient Greek mythology declared it to be the home of King Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, and commander-in-chief of the forces against Troy during the Trojan War. Schliemann had already excavated the apparent site of Troy itself, and he discovered a walled city and royal treasure even though most scholars had dismissed the possibility that the Trojan War had actually occurred. Schliemann excavated a site on the Mycenae Acropolis and found deep shaft graves. In those graves, he found bodies decorated in elaborate death shrouds, including face masks of gold and electrum. Schliemann believed he had actually found the body of King Agamemnon. Now, while most scholars dispute this, his discoveries suggest that certain places and events mentioned in the Iliad and the Odyssey might actually have existed in history. The various sources of information we have on Greek mythology and history allow us to make several broad generalizations about the nature of Greek myths. There are, of course, exceptions to these points, but they apply in many instances. First, Greek myth reflects the world in which it originated, and the key aspect of Greek life is that it was local life. We tend to think of ancient Greek culture as growing out of one homogenous nation, one extended happy family, but that wasn't the case. The ancient Greeks didn't think of themselves as Greeks. They thought of themselves as Athenians or Spartans. Their loyalties were so strong that individual city-states often developed bitter rivalries between one another. And these rivalries occasionally erupted into full-on war. Many of the myths now associated with important Greek gods and heroes probably originated as individual short stories that were first created in specific cities and regions. Over time, as traders traveled, communities migrated, and different empires conquered one another, individual tales and story clusters were shared and adapted. For example, many of the labors of Heracles are linked to specific places. It's probable that several of the Heracles stories originated as stories about local heroes. As the Heracles oral tradition spread and grew in popularity, it probably absorbed these local stories and replaced the local hero with Heracles. This is a common phenomenon in orally based traditions, and it explains how disparate episodes become linked with one another. Ultimately, it becomes impossible to extricate individual stories from one another or to describe certain clusters of stories without referencing other clusters of stories. In addition to reflecting local identity, Greek mythology was meant to be instructive. The Greek myths include basic stories about the natural world and man's relationship to that world. For example, the Titans represented forces of nature, the wind, the sea, and storms. The defeat of the Titans mythologized humanity's ability to harness these forces, to capture them, if you will. Myth worked like good advertising. It took abstract concepts, such as man's struggle to control forces that could be threatening or chaotic, 
and then it turned them into concrete figures, such as primordial gods. Greek myth also taught geography. The Iliad and the Odyssey instructed Greeks indirectly on the location of Greece with respect to its environs by transporting them from the Greek mainland to the war at Troy and from there on a tour of the rest of the known world via Odysseus's travels. But it wasn't just physical geography that Homer's poetry conveyed. In the Iliad, for example, the shield of the great Greek warrior Achilles features a map of the cosmos. Homer describes Achilles' round shield in detail, beginning with the center and moving outward. The center includes the earth, the sky, the Mediterranean sea, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The next layer includes two noble cities filled with mortal men, one ruled by law and blessed by a wedding, the other under siege. The next circle shows a field being plowed, and the fourth depicts a king's estate in the midst of harvest. The fifth circle includes a vineyard, and the sixth circle includes a herd of longhorned cattle being attacked by lions that are being fought off by the cattlemen. The seventh circle shows a peaceful sheep farm, and the eighth circle depicts a dancing scene with young men and women. Finally, the ninth circle shows the great primordial ocean that cradles the entire created world. Achilles' shield is more than a beautiful object in Homer's myth. In that shield, Homer provides a visual image of what Achilles and his fellow warriors are trying to protect, the Greek way of life. The violence and the devastation of the Trojan War is set in sharp relief against the peaceful life the warriors had left behind, not knowing if they would ever see it again. The Iliad then offers more than a great story. It offers a meditation on war and the violence that it brings. Other Greek myths also reflect the violence and the insecurity of the centuries between Greece's archaic period, the conquests of Alexander the Great, and the eventual end of Greek domination of the ancient world. In 146 BCE, Rome took over the Greek islands and peninsula. Greek culture continued to exert tremendous influence after this time. Many would argue, in fact, that Rome conquered Greece politically and militarily, but Greece conquered Rome culturally. As we'll see in later lectures, Rome basically adopted Greek mythology thus preserving it for future generations, including our own. Greek mythology sets the stage for human endeavor. It explains in story form the world into which the ancient Greeks understood they had been born, a world with natural, social, moral, and cosmic components in conflict with one another. But as we will see, it also speaks to modern audiences, by issuing a kind of existential declaration. Human beings do not get handed a blank slate. Instead, humanity steps into act two of a play already set in motion, but with no scripts or clear stage directions. It's up to human beings to negotiate the various moving parts already working at full speed and to figure out where to go from here. The various Greek mythological figures, the gods, heroes, and mythical creatures, can provide advice and limited assistance, but they do not control the outcome, and they may or may not want to help in any case. We'll also see that other cultures present alternative existential views. One benefit of learning about many great mythologies together is that they invite us to compare how different cultures have positioned humanity in the cosmos. As we continue our exploration of Greek mythology, the Titans will fade away. Their enemies, the Olympic gods, will take center stage, and we'll pick up their stories in the next lecture. But it's helpful to remember that many of the themes and much of the content that we find in Greek mythology has roots stretching back to the Titans. We continue to find references to Titans in contemporary culture as well. Many athletic teams take their name from the Titans, not to mention the ill-fated ocean liner. <laughs>
In all these cases, the name Titans connotes physical strength and power, but it also includes an element of the bittersweet and a wistful recognition that the strength of one age always gives way, eventually, to the vigor of a generation yet to come. References to the Titans are not, of course, the only way that modern athletics carries on ancient Greek traditions. As you surely know, the ancient Olympics themselves were a Greek invention. The first modern Olympic Games, held in 1896, included a men's 26-mile foot race called a marathon. Some say that the marathon was named after a legendary run by an unknown Athenian soldier. The Persians invaded Athens in 490 BCE, and when the Athenian army defeated the Persians at the Battle of Marathon, a runner was sent to announce the news. He ran 26 miles and 385 yards to announce the victory. Legend has it that when he arrived, he exclaimed, we won, and then he collapsed and died. The story of this runner, as used by the modern Olympics, is a kind of origins myth. It explains how today's marathon race came into being. There's only one problem. Evidence suggests that this story is historically inaccurate. It probably never occurred. But from a mythological perspective, this doesn't matter. What does matter is that the story gives meaning to the modern marathon by supplying meaningful origins. Men and women who run marathons now, particularly in the Olympics, can imagine themselves stepping into the shoes of an ancient runner who gave his life to bring news of victory to the Athenians. When the organizers of the modern Olympics included the marathon, they were trying to promote certain values, individual honor, love of country, and a celebration of human physical strength that transcends national boundaries. By associating the modern games with this mythological run, the organizers were hoping to give a mere foot race eternal meaning. And that's what myths do and have done from ancient times until today. Myths provide guidance. Their explanations are never primarily informational. They are meant to be transformational. We are meant to change how we live in light of the myths of our culture. We think and act in certain ways based on how we are oriented to our fundamental life circumstances, and myth provides this orientation. It guides our choices by telling us where we belong in the cosmos and in society. Myths explain the nature of life and death, the nature of true love, even the nature of a well-lived life. Of course, myths are always open to reinterpretation, even to challenges. Undoubtedly, the strange tales of the Titans held meanings for the Greeks that we don't find in them today. In the lectures to follow, we'll see that myths are rooted within individual communities, but they are also transmitted from one culture to another. And some myths evolve as they spread from one culture to another, adapting to new historical events to cultural settings, and to scientific discoveries. It's this reinterpretation and adaptation that keeps myth alive. And yet, happily, myths always retain something of their origins. As a result, stories such as those of the Titans allow us to explore some of the deepest thoughts of people whose ancient ways of life might otherwise be impossible to imagine.